Entrepreneurs Enigma is a podcast for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, so the wins and the fails that we all face being entrepreneurs, and how we learn from adversity. Every week, I talk to a different entrepreneur with a story to tell. I'm Seth Goldstein. Come with me on the journey. This is Entrepreneurs Enigma. Let's get started. Hey, everyone, welcome to another edition of the Entrepreneurs Enigma podcast. As always, I'm Seth. You're probably sick of me by now. But if you are, then why are you listening to the podcast? That's kind of interesting. So probably not sick of me for some strange reason, but that's a good thing. So today I have a friend of mine, Cash Miller. He is the CEO of Titan Digital down in, um, down in Murfreesboro. I guess it's, I think that's how you say Murf. It's not spelled Murfreesboro. It's spelled like Tennessee. But then Tennessee. Uh, Titan Digital is an Inc. 5,000 fastest growing digital marketing agency. Um, he is a veteran, twice over. He back in the in the 1990s, he was in there when he was young, kind of got his life organized and all that. And then in 2007, he went back in and went actually was deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. So thank you for your service, sir. And let's bring Cash in here. Hey, Cash, how's it going, buddy? Good. How are you? Pretty good. So two tour, not two tours, two enlistments. Yep. Or were yeah. you, or, or were you kind of a like part time during that other time? Oh no, days? no. The first enlistment was uh, three years, and uh, I joined wow. when I was twenty. Yeah, so well, like, like, most kids get out. They're like, I don't know what the hell I want to do. I need some straightening out. Yeah. Um. I had a yeah, what would be known as a come to Jesus moment. Um. Yeah. Before I joined, and it was, yeah needed to straighten my life out and the military was the way to way to go for me the army yeah. um, and the first thing i was like you know i lived in las vegas at the time um, oh geez and i got to the what's known as the mep center and they're like okay where do you want to go is you're you know getting signed up and everything i'm like as far away as possible you know so i ended up going to germany Ooh, <laughs> you know? good you know, beer yeah, it was like it was 1995 and stuff. So it was um, the military post, was kind of po- yeah, post war to post the wall is down. But yeah, kind of a little crunchy. Yeah, it, we were kind of drawn down a little bit, but we still had a lot more troops than we do you know, now. So I was like, you know, and it's funny because I got there and uh, I got there in November or let's see, it was October of uh, 1995 after I'd done my basic training and everything. Oktoberfest. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually did go to Oktoberfest in 98 with some buddies, but the um, down in München. But I was uh, I was stationed in a place uh, initially called uh, Kirschgones, and then we moved to another base called Gießen. It's uh, 45 minutes south of Frankfurt, which is like in the center of the country. But uh-huh. at the time, you know, it was still that kind of 1980s military you know, yeah, a bit. Over and, yeah, a little heavy. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was you know, drawn down some, but, um, I joined my unit. Like I got there. The stupid thing was, is in Germany, the age limit to drink is totally different. So I hadn't turned, I was about to turn 21, but I hadn't yet. I got off the plane and I was already allowed to drink. You know, I'm like, that just spoiled the whole 21 thing because I get here and I can do it. right. I can do it right away. And then it was, um, not even two months later, my unit was training in the field. So I ended up joining them in the field. Yeah. Which is for maneuvers, exercises and stuff, you know. You practice. Um, you got to practice. Yeah, yeah you got to practice. practice. But not even two months later, um, the uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Kosovo, you know, the whole Yugoslavia the, the breakup. Whole draft, yeah. Yeah. Yugoslavia had broken up and um, President Clinton at the time had they'd done the Dayton Peace Accords. Yeah, and they and they said, okay, we're gonna send in peacekeeping troops, and it was my division chosen. So I'd been in Germany two months, and I found myself on like uh, New Year's Day on a bus on my way to Bosnia and Herzegovina. I had not wow. gotten a chance to enjoy anything. <laughs> I wanted to go to Germany so I could ex- also experience it. You know, it was yeah, but it wasn't just, just more experiences. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was a, just that was a military. wild ride. Yeah, yeah, and I ended up spending like nine months over there. I was one of the first like thousand troops so it's like january i mean it's like a real wake-up call to life in general because i was on a bus we went from germany through like hungary um we get to bosnia and herzegovina and i was in artillery um so 
we get the bus, you know, and it's just a regular coach bus, you know, big ass bus. <laughs> We've got our gear and our equipment had been sent on train earlier with some of our, the people in my unit. Yeah. And uh, so we're there to join them. The bus stops. I'm looking out over this farm field covered in snow. It's cold as hell. Guy comes up to the bus, says, go find your gun. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, welcome to the army. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Good, that's good, good, the party yeah my gun's like yeah. set up out in the field and stuff because we had like three or four people i think i think it was four people of our section you know with there yeah. and it's like okay great and so that that's how I, I spent like the next nine months of my life until we got like rotated back and i'm like Ugh. oh wow so, it's your, yeah. your stories to say the least <laughs> yeah you end up with a lot of story you know any military person will tell you that they're you know they're a lot of stories because yeah, let me say it. Because then, then, in 2007, you went back in. Yeah, and now 2007, I was uh, yeah, older and wiser and a bit more prepared. You knew um, what you were getting yourself into, but still, now yeah. you go uh, now you go somewhere hot. Yeah, because in 2000, we're gonna take a quick break here from our sponsors and get right back to the show. 2007, when I joined, I mean, I knew it was a given that I would be deployed either to Iraq or Afghanistan. The likelihood at the time was Iraq. And so I joined back up in like March or was it? No, I joined up in um, January yeah. of 2007. Uh, they put me through a refresher course with yeah, people. The, yeah, it that, yeah it basically, can you shoot and can you march still and can you take orders? And I was like, yeah, I can, you know, so you go through instead of basic training again, the army had a program for people transferring from other branches or that were prior service. I, I ended up getting trained for like four weeks by the New Mexico National Guard. You know, oh, like, wow. I mean, and it was were, like, and then you also became a sergeant then. So, yeah, I, it took me like two years. I had a plan, um, when I went back in. So I, you know, I was a bit older. I was 32 at the time. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to work for a bunch of people that are like younger than me and things like that. I'm like, yeah. You know, so I got to get promoted quick. So I did everything in my power and I had to wait two years to be able to get it. I managed to get it in two years in like one month. Oh, yeah, nice. To, to be able, you know, I hit almost the exact time allowed, and I got promoted to uh, E5 sergeant when I was in uh, uh, Iraq and did my, what's known as a promotion board and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I remember the sergeant major, he, he said, you know, if you pass the board, you're going to walk out and you're going to be promoted next month. You're right. Because I'd already gotten all my points, which the Army works off a point system. And I was like, yep. That was the idea, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, you know, but I also wanted the extra money too because it's it comes. Yeah, with of raise. course, of course. So it's the yeah. fast forward. So you got out of the military. I'm looking at your LinkedIn over here. You were still in the military when you started Titan. Yeah, Ish. Um, Ish. yeah. So I I had been an entrepreneur for like eight years. Yeah. I'd run a business in between. I'm not good about working for other people. Um, yeah, you went into the military. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, oh, I, went, that's, that's, I did that's, the military that's right there. That's an enigma. Yeah. Yeah. Enigma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like I say it's a, uh, um, the military is not the same as, you know, working for a, you know, company or a business. And I, you yeah. know, work for, you know, I just, I tell people I never lasted more than three months at any actual job. So, yeah. um, and that's the truth. I never did. Um, yeah, except for the military, but, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah so I started in the military. So yeah, well, it's not to be kind of committed. So yeah, you have to, you know, so, you know, I, when I went back in going to Iraq, I needed basically, it was kind of a hobby, you know, in a sense, I started, um, a small business website. Uh, mm -hmm. I started writing a lot of content for it. And yeah. I said, you know, one day I said, how do I get traffic to this thing? So I started studying, you know, SEO and it was 07. So it was still very early in SEO. Yeah, you did, you did. The, the old, the old, your OG. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that, you know, like people would put out online just like they do nowadays, but it was, the tactics were a lot different. It was still, mm -hmm. I say very, it was very early in the, the field and there weren't any kind of professional courses really. I mean, there was some no. stuff that individuals had put out to teach you, but that's it. And I spent the next few years studying. The first thing I figured out is I didn't want to write all the content myself. So yeah. I started um, contacting business coaches, figuring that their content would be the same as what I'm writing anyway. So I would find content online that was written by coaches. And I would ask, you know, I'd contact them and say, hey, do you mind if I publish on my site? That way I could focus on the traffic. Well, I was doing well enough on the traffic that some of them started asking me because they were getting referrals. I put in their links and everything back. Yeah, to me, you, you, know. you scratch my back, I scratch your back kind of thing. Yeah, I give them the credit and stuff. It's their, you know, their content. 
but they started getting traffic to their site from my site. And then they started asking me like, how are you doing this? Like, and can you help us? And some of them were willing to pay me, you know, I'm like, okay. And this is while you're in the military too. So it's yeah. Lot. So, you know, it's like, say, you know, before side, you know, was it side hustles became a thing, you know, you like, a, hustling, yeah. Yeah. Whoever coined the term side hustle, I was, I was doing my own side hustle. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And one thing led to another and eventually I get, you know, I get to like 2011 and I'm, in Afghanistan and my contract's coming up and I'm like, okay, so do I want to keep doing this military thing? Um, or do I want to go back to being an entrepreneur and I'll start different kinds of shots fired. (laughs) Yeah. Well, they say when you're, when you're deployed, you know, um, I'd been at that point in at the end of my contract, another four and a half years, I spent seven and a half years total. So at the end of that four and a half years, I'd been gone a lot. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I had a family at that point. I'm like, do I really want to? Cause I knew I would get deployed again. It's just inevitable. Um, you know, so it was like, let me see if I can make this a shot. And I started, you know, our agency yeah. and I started with just to focus on SEO. That was it. Now the focus on SEO lasted two months. And you know, when I go to sell my first client and they don't have a website. I'm like, I can't sell something that, you know, I can't SEO something that doesn't yeah, exist. You, so you did it backwards. Like I did, I did, I did web design, went into SEO. So I had the structure to build out stuff. You went from yeah. SEO and realized, oh crap, I need to put this stuff on. Yeah. And so I started yeah. teaching myself WordPress and I had found a graphic designer to help yeah. me. And, and the, it was the first site I ever sold and I didn't sell it. I gave it to them Oh wow! because, because I signed them to a monthly SEO contract. Yeah. And, and it, it's the best freebie I ever gave away because they ended up a client. Um, they only just recently, really, uh, recently retired. They were a client oh, wow. for like for something like about ten years total. That's and a big client. I, I have a few of those that are like light lifers. I've done this, I've redone their site like three or four times already. You know. Yeah, and they never let me redo the site. It was up there for the ten years. Horrible. You know, oh it's like. Yeah, I did it for free, and you know, yeah, it's but I ended up WordPress is not what it is now, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I used a free theme at the time to get it done, and but that site made me over forty thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, I say, you know, because didn't charge nearly what you know what uh, never when you us and others yeah. charge. Yeah, it was you know charged like three hundred fifty bucks a month to do the SEO, and they were in Nashville. Oh, wow. Got a rank. Yeah, I mean, it's not what people charge. Exactly. But I mean, it was over a decade ago. So it's like, yeah, exactly. You do what you have to do to land the first client. Hell, it took me two months to land the first client. Then I ended up getting two and within like a two week span. But that first two months. It always works out that way. It's it's just like kind of karma gets going. Yeah. And, you know, but boy, I'll tell you what, talk about nerve wracking when it takes you two months and you're like, I just gave up a career to see if this would work. And it's not working so far. You know, I'm like, ugh. You, know, you, got, you got to bite, the, bite it and just kind of keep going, you know? Yeah. I ended up hiring my first employee actually within like six months, you know, because. Wow. Yeah. It, because we, you know, I started selling websites and, you know, now, you yeah, know, the say, scale fast, fast forward to now and I've got 30 plus, you know, I think we're at 32 or something employees or something. Anyhow. All remote or do you have an office now? Or? Um, We've got multiple offices, but then they're, they're allowed to work as, um you know, remote as well so uh so the, it's, there's a place that can congregate if they need to congregate but like, yeah there's value in being able to get people together but it's not necessary to have them together every day yeah. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so there's a lot of these companies need to realize is that they you know they don't require them to come in just have have on sites they literally yeah. have on sites not off sites because you're not you're off all the time but have on sites Mm-hmm. And have everyone get together monthly to talk about what's going on, you know? Yeah. So it's, you know, the agency side is, it's been a roller coaster over the years. You know, you have your ups and downs it's like you would know. So. Absolutely. So what's the best thing about being an entrepreneur in your mind? Um, honestly, the best thing, you would say freedom, except that I, I talked to somebody the other day. It's like, well, you know, the uh, different kind of freedom. Yeah, it's a different kind of freedom because I'm not told what to do. Yeah. Uh, but taking a vacation can be a pain. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you know, because you've got to let everybody else do their job, and hopefully, no fires happen that you got to put out. Exactly. Uh, but really, honestly, the best thing about being an entrepreneur is the ability to let your creative side, you know, free. So, you know, you have when you see an opportunity, you have the ability to pursue it. You don't need anybody's permission. You just have to decide whether it's worth pursuing and what resources you're going to put towards it. You know, and that's the beauty 
uh, you know, yeah. because you have that, you have an outlet that's natural. Like everybody's got some sort of creative bent to them. It just yeah. varies. I'm a horrible graphic designer. Okay. So I don't have that kind of, mine judging is from about, that 10 year old site, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mine is about, uh, being able to like, I tend to fall into that visionary thing. I can see it. I can see other, I can see, give me somebody else's idea and I'll figure out how to run with it. Get, you know, yeah. I'll come up with their original ideas and I'll figure out how to run with it. I'm really good about, you know, being able to do that. And that's the enjoyable thing for me is mm -hmm. I see something like we've gotten into podcasting too. And, you know, we go from doing our own shows to signing other people up to do their shows and do production yeah. and, yeah, and it's that kind of thing that it says, it well, morphs, what are the possibilities? Yeah, yeah it, it can morph, morph yeah. and you can pursue it. You got to know if it's not working, you, you also need to learn to accept defeat, you know, if yeah. it's not going to work out. Fast. Yeah, yeah, but but you, you really get that kind of freedom and you don't, you know, if you work for a big corporation, you don't have that kind of freedom. You no, know? absolutely not, yeah. You know, yeah, entrepreneurs, small business owners, you know, they have the, you know, everything's on you. The buck stops with you, but the, you know, flip side yeah. is, is you get that creativity. Yep. So on the other, on the flip side, what keeps you up at night? Um, what keeps me up at night? Well, you, this kind of business has its ups and downs. You're going to yeah. gain clients. You're going to lose clients. You know, it's just, you know, every agency owner will tell you. So what keeps me up at night is you still have the same things. You've got to make your payroll. You've got to, yeah. you know, you got your bills to pay, you know, whatever they may be. You're trying to grow it. You're trying to, you know, figure out roadblocks. Every business, ends up running into roadblocks and oh they're God. trying to figure out how to get over them. And I don't care who you are. You're going to run into them. Yeah. You know, oh my so, God. It's inevitable. Yeah, it is. It's just a matter of what it is and how long it takes you to figure out a way through it. If you can, you know, mm -hmm. so those are the things that keep you up at night. I know, you know, I say, if you're sleeping well, you know, well, you're not, you know, you've gotten past them or, you know, they haven't, you, you know, haven't hit them hit yet. yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, so you're always going to have things that keep you up at night. And the thing about being an entrepreneur and the one thing you have to accept is no matter what decision you make, somebody's unhappy with it. Oh, you know, it's, no one never, not everyone's happy. Yeah, you can't, whether it's your employees, it could be your clients, you know, whatever it is, somebody will disagree, say you're wrong. You shouldn't do it. It's not going to work. You're going to have naysayers and you have to, you know, that's the thing you cannot, it will bother you. There's your, yeah. you wouldn't be human if it didn't bother you to some degree, but yeah. you have to be able to overlook it. You have to be able to look past it really. Yeah. And you have to be able to shrug it off and say, look, I wrote an article, uh, I'm a member of the Forbes agency council and a couple mm -hmm. of years I wrote an article and I said that the, in the article basically said at the uh, end of the day, unless you have partners, um, you know, go 10 years down the road and everybody that was a naysayer or whatever probably isn't going to be in your company anyway. You know, <laughs> it's not because you let them go or anything. They'll leave them of their own accord. That's just the nature of things. Yeah. But you're the only one that you actually have to satisfy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the trick with it. And, but you have to be under, you have to understand that and you have to be willing to not take it all so personally. Yes. Yeah. Because if you do, like I say, you can't please everybody. You know, and if you try, you're just going to make yourself miserable. Absolutely. So what is the most important thing to carry with you all the time? Um, the most important thing to carry with you? Yeah. Well, well when I was in the military, I was a Leatherman. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> never, there's, there's, I still have a Leatherman and I'm not in the military, but yeah. Yeah. No, I carried that thing on my hip every day for like, you know, for my entire service. Um, yeah. But as an entrepreneur, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. The one like I think the one thing to carry with you is stay humble actually, because entrepreneurship yeah. will humble you. you oh know? my God. It beats it into you. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. but I, but don't be so, you know, like be proud of your accomplishments, understand that you have to constantly look at the bigger picture. You know, mm -hmm. um, your job is to look at the bigger picture and, you know, they have the saying of, you know, um, work on your business, not in your business. You know? Yes. And you have to understand to be able to separate the two, mm -hmm. you know, and I think the one thing that um, entrepreneurs have this big failure to, you know, there's a, when you go to sell your business and I'm not looking to sell or anything, but when you do um, a lot of businesses, I think it's like 80% don't actually sell. 
Yeah, it's yeah. a really high number that they, they end up shut down instead because they can't find a buyer. And the thing is, is you should always be considering every day when you go to work, you have to be considering how do you separate yourself from the business? If you grow it enough, mm -hmm. how do you separate it? Because it's the only way you create true value, okay? Uh, when you become an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily do it for the money. Yes, everybody likes the money. I really, yeah. If you can get somewhere, okay? Not everybody mm -hmm. does. But you could achieve an, an, a payday down the road because at some point you're going to want to call it a day. You know, you, yeah. you know, you will at some point. Now, it could be 20 years down the road. You don't know. Yeah. But you should always be setting up your business with the idea of what does it do? You know, how does it run if you are not involved in the day-to-day -day affairs? And that should be the thing that you really carry with yeah. you is how do you make that happen? At the very least, it allows you to take a stress-free vacation. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. I haven't <laughs> taken one of them in a while. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you need to do that. And if you don't do that, if you're not considering that, thinking about that, you'll be stuck in the grind every single day. I am fortunate mm -hmm. enough to have gotten to a place where I have a um, president of the company and I'm the CEO. The president deals with, I've got somebody I can trust, does a really good job. Certain things are better at than I am. You know, the whole you know, hire for the, your weaknesses, you know? Yeah. Hire, hire, yeah. Do what you're good at hire for the rest. Exactly. So, um, so you want to be able to position your business to eventually be able to do that, you know, to be able to break away. So you're going to have certain concerns, but at least you'll have less of them. You shouldn't have to be fighting On every day fire. Day, yeah. yeah. You, if you are in a position to make, to have to make every decision, you've created a job, you haven't created a business, you know, and even mm -hmm. if you have employees, you're still got a job, you know, exactly. and you want to be able to have it run on its own at some point. Absolutely. So, so where can people find you online? Like where's your water hole online? What's, what's well, the big site? Um, you know, companies, Titan digital.com. The biggest place you can find me, like I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Cause we, you know, I play on there a lot. Yeah. It's uh, hard not to when you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. With content, you know, we've got our own podcast marketing masters. Um, Check it out. We'll have it in the show notes. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, uh, but I'm on there and I actually managed to get, I think mine is like just forward slash cash Miller. So I'm because Ooh. of my, you know, my, because of my first name, I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn. You are. Um, I found yeah, you very easily. Yeah. You're not going to find a bunch of others, um, you know, with my kind of a name. So that makes it, you know, because I'll tell you what, I've looked, I've searched other people on LinkedIn and I'm like, okay, you know, which of these 20 people are they? Um, exactly. And sometimes I have pictures up. It's like, what? Yeah, and I and I can be emailed at cash at titan digital dot com. But yeah, LinkedIn is my typical playing ground for anything social media. Sounds good. Well, Cash, this has been so much fun. I'm glad we got to reconnect. And we will see everyone next time. Yeah, it's great being here. That was a great show. If you're enjoying Entrepreneurs Enigma, please review us in the podcast directory of your choice. Every review helps other podcast listeners find our show. If you're looking for other podcasts in the marketing space, look no further than the Marketing Podcast Network at marketingpodcasts.net. Goldstein Media hopes you have enjoyed this episode.